The Tor browser is one of the most common ways that you or anyone else could access the dark web. It's a web browser that allows you to visit these onion addresses or websites hosted across Tor hidden services. It routes your traffic through all these nodes and you have to know the exact URL or location as to where you want to go and how to get there. And it is the dark web after all. There's a lot of weird stuff available out and about for sale, whether it's malware, hey, information information, database dumps, passwords, credentials that are leaked, put out into the public, and drugs, illicit, illegal, stuff that shouldn't be out and about. I'm looking at one of those dark web marketplaces now, and hey, you can see all the sketchy stuff that they might offer. Now, let me say, a lot of this may very well be a scam, not real, totally illegitimate, and just garbage and trash, but this stuff is out there. Even just taking a look at everything that they post, my goodness, it's pretty wild. Now, now, I'm more interested in the cybersecurity implications. I'm wondering about those adversaries, the threat actors, the bad people and attackers that might be selling malware, ransomware, info stealers, or whatever, and knowing what they're up to. So I like to look around the dark web and use the Tor browser for research. But I got to thinking, hey, are there any sort of breadcrumbs or fingerprints left behind from even using that software and perusing, snooping around? So in this video, I'd like to dig into that. Are there any forensic artifacts from the Tor browser? But before we dive in, I want to give you a little bit more background context. I love to use Flare to do some of that dark web dumpster diving and just seeing what is out there because it gives me an exposure profile. Hey, let me know even myself individually or my company or my business, what risks are up against me for a lot of that public exposed information, stuff that might be in a ransomware leak site or sold on a marketplace could be anything. I could set up different identifiers for things that I want to track, like a business or just threats in cybercrime that I'm interested and want to stay on top of. You could even generate reports, send them to Slack, send them to Jira, send them to email, whatever. I don't want to beat you over the head with this process here, but I think it's pretty cool. Hey, we can create an identifier for a website domain, anyone's name, email, IP address, whatever, and you could set different severity filters or create any alerts that we might like to bring it to email or Slack or anything else. With any identifier that's set up, you could filter and narrow it down into different categories, or where Flare might try to search for, track and find that information, whether it's on the open internet, on the clear net, or the dark web. Those shady, kind of questionable, illicit places where information might be exposed, like those ransomware leak sites, hey, stolen breach credentials, data dumps that are available, marketplaces, telegram chats, whatever, and Flare is pulling this information from a ton of different collection points. It's wild, you can find so much stuff. They also do a lot of really incredible stuff in correlating all this data. One of their new features, uh, Threat Flow, over in beta on the navigation here, they pull together a whole lot of this information and then add it with context of what's happening in the real world. Like what these threat actors, what these cyber criminals are up to, and then seeing that across the cybersecurity landscape. I think it's pretty slick. But anyway, using this for research is really cool because we basically have a giant Google search across like all all of those sketchy places in the dark web, and I could just search for anything I wanted to, whether it's ransomware or info stealer malware or leak sites or database dumps, etc., etc., or just anything. Here, say I wanted to search for the Tor browser, and I'm on the global section here with whatever severity in any of the categories. But you know what? Let's filter that down to some of those illicit networks. In fact, it might be cool to just drill down into marketplaces. So I'll hit apply on this, and that will search. And hey, there's that Nemesis market market and the Lincoln sphere that I was showing you just a moment ago. Look at this. There's like five and a half thousand events. Some of the chatter on Nemesis market, different actors or users that are sharing whatever products or whatever they might be putting out for sale there. And oh, okay. Drug hub. Let's avoid that. Let me see what else we have. A lot of Nemesis market, a lot of Nemesis market, different actors, different users posting stuff on there. There's a Bohemia market, more Nemesis, Kerberos. That's an odd one. Ah, more druggy stuff. Not my bag. Um, um, what else do we have? Oh, here's a new one, Kingdom Market. Let me go grab the link on that. I want to take a look. Oh, that gave me a 404. That 
URL is not found. Okay, does the homepage load? Oh, <laughs> this platform and the criminal content has been seized by law enforcement in Operation Fallen Kingdom. Man, they always have clever names. Hey, you know, with that said, gentle reminder, uh, don't be a cyber criminal. Don't do any of this stuff. It's illegal. I don't by any means mean to be emboldening or emblazoning cybercrime threat actors. It's bad stuff. Don't do it. Now, if I may, I will mention that Flair has an incredible database of leaked credentials. Like, if you wanted to kick the tires, hey, give Flair a try, you could probably pretty likely find some, hey, corporate credentials that have just been exposed public out on the internet. And that is a bad thing. Oh, look at this. Okay, that's, whoops, uh, probably current real data that I'm not able to show you, so I'm gonna redact that one. But if I were to click in on any of these results, you can see where these all came from, how the passwords or credentials were published out on the internet, and the source, in a lot of cases, is from stealer logs, or the data that is captured and then exfiltrated by an info stealer malware. Now, I'll admit, I talk about info stealer malware a lot, but that's because it is so prevalent and prolific and it does so much damage. But anyway, look, if you're interested in Flare, please do try it out, link in the video description. But you can find info stealer malware like everywhere. We talk about Redline Stealer, Raccoon Stealer, Vidar, Jupiter, there are so many, and look, even out on the public open internet. This is literally GitHub. Sapphire Stealer, you can see it here, even has support, hey, just write me over on Discord. And look, it's a C-sharp stealer, and it will try to pull information from web browsers like session cookies, passwords, credentials, anything that it might be able to grab a hold of. Look at this. They have a screenshot of what they've stolen here in passwords.txt over on Notepad from Discord, YouTube, Google. Oh, geez. But again, this is literally on GitHub. Like, we could go take a look through the source, and we've seen it in tons of videos before. Look, if I wanted to dig into some of the modules or how it actually went about its business, trying to steal, get information, here in this case, browsers, like Chromium or Chrome or whatever, I don't know, Firefox, Microsoft Edge, whatever you want here, we could dig into it and note, this is pretty common. This is standard procedure to steal from web browsers all the information that it can get. So with that in mind, I started to think about, you know, we use the Tor web browser to try to research and go find and look at some of this stuff. So is there ever the potential to get secrets or information just stolen, exfiltrated, ripped out of Tor or the Tor browser? What forensic artifacts exist for the Tor browser? Now, here's the thing. I have been using the Tor browser on on Hunix, one of those Linux distributions that comes with it installed, readily available for you, with privacy and anonymity in mind. And of course, there is Tails, or Tails Linux, another one of those Linux distributions with anonymity and privacy in mind, but meant to be ran from like a bootable USB drive, or some removable media, so nothing ever writes to disk or touches the file system, meant to be ephemeral, totally temporary, and have amnesia baked in. But the Tor browser could be installed and ran on Windows, just like we saw at the beginning of the video. And at the end of the day, it is just a web browser, right? Similar to Chrome or Firefox or Edge. And it's actually, I think, built off of one of the extended releases of Firefox with a little bit more capability built in. And if you aren't familiar, Firefox actually caches a lot of the information that you might go to. So if I were to actually go to my app data directory using the percent signs as an environment variable there, I could go dig into the Mozilla folder for Mozilla Firefox, click in there, go take a look at the default profiles, any of them might be created here. I think the default release is usually what fills things up here. And we have some other files like SQLite databases. A lot of the internal cache files are present and located here, and even this is the stuff that InfoStealer malware will cut up, rip through, try to exfiltrate to pull that sensitive browser information out of. One of the kind of more notorious or infamous artifacts in here is this places.sqlite file. It is a SQL database, SQLite structured query language in a small singular file, and I had gone ahead and downloaded the SQLite database browser. You can go find SQLite browser and pull that down here, just a simple installer. But if I were to open that up, I would then be able to see basically everything, all of my history and all the table, column, whatever information is present in different places that I've visited. Here you can go see me downloading Golang. 
or digging into Maldev Academy. Hey, slapping chocolatey in there using Nim, looking at some of the Microsoft docs, local stuff, Hexacorn blog, blah, blah, blah. This is literally my browser's history. We could look through different tables to kind of see bookmarks or even other input form field history or other metadata, just about anything that the browser might store and keep track of. So I had to wonder, does the Tor browser store and cache this same information that could be used to see, oh, what onion sites are you visiting? Where where in the dark web are you going to? And it turns out, uh, sort of, kind of, if I actually go take a look as to where Tor is installed, or at least where it might store its browser information, we could see a lot of the similar sort of structure here. Again, it is built off of Firefox, so a lot of the internals are there. But digging down into the Tor browser folder, in the data section inside of browser, we could find the profile information, like profile default, and eventually, even the very same places.sqlite file. So if I were to open this up, we'll see all of the exact same tables, but I'll be the first to admit, uh, there's nothing about my history in these places. I see these as like default onion links that are, seem to be present every single time, but no other titles or, hey, date last accessed or anything other than, hey, the default stuff that comes with the Tor browser. I've never honestly seen this actually updated with any other history or data for me. Like, look, even back on Hunix, the Linux distribution where I had been browsing around different onion sites. Say I were to open up the terminal. Uh, if I wanted to go open up a new location here, that should be in my current directory and in the .tb hidden directory. If I move into that directory, we can get into some of the internals for the Tor browser, right? So let me hop over there into that directory. Again, browser as we were previously. And if I wanted to, not even dealing with all the other stuff that's present in this directory, say I were to just simply try to find and grep for places.sqlite. And I'm sure I could, yeah, just pass that in with a name. That's probably even a little bit better Unix philosophy, so I won't get angry YouTube comments. I will anyway. Uh, but there we go. We'll see our places.sqlite file. Now, again, I could sudo apt install SQLite browser, the default password for a Hunix account is all lowercase change me, which you should in fact change. But again, let me open up SQLite browser on that location. And uh, oh, database is locked. That's because Tor is open. Let me go uh, nuke that. There we go. Uh, and let's restart that digging into it live in the moment here. If I go browse data from all of the onion sites that you just saw me dig into checking out the places here, nothing other than those defaults, even from the history that I just had open in my browser. And honestly, if we wanted to make this kind of simple. Look, if I just reopen the Tor browser, try to take a look at my history, you can see there's nothing there. It just won't even keep track of that. So at least from what I've seen, the Tor browser will not store your history or whatever metadata inside of its own internal cache and files like the SQLite database. Now, this is probably a good thing. Like, look, we wanted that anonymity and privacy. So whatever research that we do on the dark web and these Tor hidden services, onion sites, we don't need to keep and leave those breadcrumbs behind. But I did try to Google and research this, see what else folks are seeing for forensics or forensic artifacts of the Tor browser. This article was a relatively recent 2023 from Bala Subramanya. So hey, kudos, credit, big thanks to him, uh, showcasing a little bit more of the Tor Tor browser and more discussion on hey how it's built off of the extended support release of Firefox. And he mentions exactly this setup, Tor browser data browser, that directory and location, the places.sqlite file, maybe some others in the mix here, but I hadn't seen anything of that, truthfully. They showcase some of the stuff on a Windows command prompt, hey, if it's installed within Windows, and a little bit more insight into the Windows registry. I'll dig into that in just a second, but let me correlate this a bit. I did find another article from Data Forensics and Raj Kumar, uh, it looks like April 16th of 2022, and they dig into this and a lot more of the forensics, talking about, hey, how Tor comes to life here. But they note some of the interesting stuff if I were to get into the those data browser profile default and SQLite databases. Again, that place is .sqlite, but they noticed the same as I did, there wasn't really anything there. At least from my reading and interpretation, I believe they say there are no artifacts that can be found in 
the Tor browser when compared with Firefox or other browsers. But that's not to say that there are no forensic artifacts whatsoever. There are some others, they just aren't as interesting as what could have been a full dump of all of the Onion URLs that are accessed. Inside of both a Linux install and a Windows install, if we get back to our terminal, we should be able to track down the state file. I'll try to find that on the command line. I believe it's in Tor browser here, just in data and under browser. There we go. Inside of a profile, just as we were previously, there is a bit more to dig into on the Windows side. Back in the internals here of our Tor browser folder, if I navigate up at a couple directories here, digging into the data section, we still have Tor as another subdirectory alongside the browser. And that gives us a little bit more insight as to, hey, what's going on using the Tor network to access these Tor nodes. One of the interesting files is the state file. And we saw this actually in a previous video, digging into some malware sample that would use Tor to tunnel network traffic. And if I try to open this up, that will at least clue us in as to when Tor was last used. See the last time it was generated over here for the current timestamp as I'm recording and doing this show. That is in local time, so something to take note of if you use this as a forensic artifact. And there are some other breadcrumbs or tidbits you could track down with the Windows registry. We could use regedit to dig into that, but look, let me say, I'll sprinkle in a little bit of extracurricular. I know that regedit kind of sucks as a uh, program and software to view and edit the Windows registry. If you aren't familiar, a sweet utility is called regcool, and that actually is an advanced registry editor for doing some work with the Windows registry. Gives you a heck of a lot more power and is a whole lot faster than the default regular regedit. You've got edit undo capability, find and replace, comparing registries, drag and drop, snapshot, backup and restore. It's pretty slick. So if we wanted to, you could go find online, Kurt Zimmerman software, and we can go simply download that advanced registry editor, RegCool. Let me fire it up. I can cruise through the installation process, uh, but I would definitely recommend it if you tend to tinker or work inside the Windows registry for whatever research you might do. Sweet, RegCool is installed. Let me see if I can fire it up. Looking good. Now I know this is like baby basics, but seriously, I have the capability to do this now with the reg cool tool, say or to dig into some of the software, maybe Mozilla, if we were thinking we might track stuff down for Firefox, again, with Tor browser being built off of it. But I can honestly just straight up search for Tor browser and see if I can track anything down. There we go. Take a look, just clicking on it and drilling down. We see a whole lot of these registry keys that might clue us in to, hey, some shell bags, stuff that could be used for more forensic artifacts, potentially other tidbits, and especially the Tor project Firefox launcher. Digging into that for our current user hive, a couple of others that might be worthwhile, but this I think is the most common indicator at the very least that Tor is installed and in use for this installation of Windows. I had seen a couple of the other articles showcase registry keys kind of similar to this, but they would just go straight to Mozilla uh, and note that, oh, if the Firefox launcher were to include this, granted, I have genuine real Firefox installed inside of this virtual machine. So I also see Tor project as one opportunity to go track that down. Some of the other artifacts that are discussed are regular prefetch files. Granted, hey, that could be any artifact from anything or just pulling stuff out of memory. If you can use tools like volatility or dig into a memory dump, that might get some interesting worthwhile stuff, though I realize that's not always feasible. And then they even mention, oh, just network traffic, PCAP, trying to see what stuff is in there, but you won't be able to see the contents to begin with because it's all funneling through that network of Tor. So with all that said, I don't readily see a way for you to sort of snoop and sleuth through all of the individual onion addresses or URLs or websites you visit in the dark web through the Tor browser. And maybe that's a good thing, right? Hey, it's meant to be for anonymity and privacy and all that. But look, if you've got the state file, maybe some of the Windows registry, you could still see the artifact that it's installed, it's in use in the last time that it was used. Hey, your mileage may vary, but I thought that was interesting on a little bit of pulling back the curtain, what are the forensic artifacts of the Tor browser? And look, if you're doing some of that research, if you want to know your attack surface, the risk information that's exposed out there, please seriously do give Flare a try. Link in the video description. They've got some incredible stuff, and I'm a huge fanboy of all the stuff that Flare does. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do all those YouTube algorithm things, like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.